Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Pathfinder Keymaker Enhanced Edition with me, Bring It On. Off camera, I did build a bulletin board in the capital uh, because I forgot to do that last episode. And I also only made one purchase. Uh, I got the Eyes of the Eagle for Jathal. Helmet only grants us wear a plus five confidence bonus and perception checks. And that's all I bought. I'm there. All right, so this will be another slower episode. I'm going to talk to a couple of companions that we haven't talked to yet. A harem, and there's another one right there. Kaisi's house. And I'll stop by the other companions and see if they have anything to say. But I doubt they do this early on. All right, harem pulls his beard, muttering something that could be either prayers or curses. Upon noticing you, he winces. Eh, what? Ah, it's you, Don Victus. Uh, did I startle you? I'm sorry. Oh no, that doesn't matter. I was just contemplating the futility of existence and the worthlessness of the universe. The ways of Grotus are great. My humble mortal mind cannot fully grasp them, but I do what I can. Harem smiles apologetically. <laughs> he is either my favorite character or my second favorite character in the game. Uh, we haven't met my the other candidate yet. Uh, tell me about your past. Uh, my life is divided into two parts. The first was filled with blind wandering, doubts, and attempts to serve Toreg. The second part began when I accepted Grotus into my soul and received a clear vision of the world. What exactly would you like to know? Uh, where are you from? My life story began in Larad, a city of Dwarven clerics and acolytes. They serve Toreg and the other Dwarven gods, Toreg's brothers, Angrad and Magrum. Uh, Toreg's wife, Fulgrit, his daughter, Bolka, his sons, Grundinar, Coles, and Trud, and also Toreg's sister, Drang Drangvit. Uh, Harem curves his lips in contempt. I wouldn't be surprised if they built a temple to Torag's pet dog. Sorry, I let myself get carried away. Harem sighs and pulls his beard several times. Larad is the second largest Dwarven city in the Five Kings Mountains. It's built up around numerous temple caverns, which serve as places of worship for all the Dwarven gods. Many pilgrims from every corner of Galarian come to Larad to, pay to pray to their gods. Some remain to live there. The city is simply imbued with faith. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cleric. It's no surprise, inspired by the aura of the city, that I, that I decided as a young boy to dedicate all my efforts to becoming a cleric of Toreg. You once tried to serve Toreg? Not just tried, it was a burning passion. I craved it by day and dreamt of it at night. Harem shakes his head as if amazed by, by his own stupidity. You see, Don Victus, from my first days, I felt the presence of the god at my back. I heard his whispers and felt his power, though the nature of this power was unclear to me. I thought Torag himself was trying to speak to me, and I did all I could to understand his words. Oh, what a naive fool I was. I had no idea that Torag, that uncompromising, conceited god glamorized by all dwarves, was capable of betrayal. He turned away from me, Don Victus. He left me in the hour when I put all my hopes in him, and desperately needed his support. Torag is the god of craftsmanship, so every follower, especially the clerics, must smith their own suit of armor. The day when this work is finished is, the, is like the second birthday for a dwarf. Uh, he's newly born in the eyes of Toreg. Harem sighs heavily and falls silent for a time. My second birthday never came. I couldn't make armor. Not even a sword, not even a simple nail. My hammer smashed my fingers and fell on my feet. Molten iron burned my hands. The clerics laughed as they healed me. They used to say I was cursed by Toreg. So, I fin so finally I gave up any attempt to please the betrayer god. Uh, even if Toreg really has rejected you, is that enough reason to leave your homeland? You don't know much about dwarves. Harem lets out a sad sigh. How can a dwarf cursed by Torag go on living in a city where every single soul bows to Torag? I was alone. Disgraced, humiliated, insulted. A lone tear glints in the light before sliding down Harem's cheek and hiding in his beard. I was trying to drown my sorrows in drink, but even the owner of the cheapest pub on the road would laugh at me while he put those mugs in front of me. I couldn't take it any longer. I wanted everything to end. Uh, but there was one thing that kept me going, and prevented me from ending my life. I could still hear that divine whisper behind my back. It was yet faint. It took a long time before I could hear it clearly. But having heard it once, I could never forget it. It was clear that none of Larad's deities favored me, so I left the Five Kings Mountains and went out searching. Yeah, I didn't think dwarves ever worshipped Grotus. How did you learn about him? Oh, but that blessed day became the beginning of a new life. Alone and abandoned by all, I spent many dull hours in a filthy tavern by the roadside. I don't recall the town, nor even the country. I had no money. In fact, all I had was a hunk of stale bread. 
I was weary and almost fainting from hunger. And that was the moment when the whisper from my god became more clear. It was like he was calling me. At last my sufferings had come to an end. It was a miracle, Don Victus, and I had paid full price for it with my torments. I couldn't control myself. I walked out of the tavern and straight into the nearest forest, and there I found the ruined temple of Erodin, the lost god. Several figures clad in robes were holding a silent service there, a service to a god I knew nothing of. None minded when I stood beside them. For the first time in my life, I felt, I felt myself at home. My new brothers told me they were clerics of Grotus, the god of end times. They were traveling around Galarian, spreading the teachings of Grotus, despite all the persecution, contempt, and misjudgment they received from others. I gladly shared this burden with them, for now I knew whose voice had whispered to me through, all, whispered to me through all those years. Wait, so you could make it even a simple nail, and you blame Torig? Are you suggesting that my problem was not a curse, just my own inability to work with metal, or maybe you're saying that I was just too lazy? Harem looks into your eyes defiantly, his hands trembling with suppressed rage as he runs his fingers over his beard. You're a fool if you think so, an ignorant fool. Have you ever met a dwarf who couldn't handle a smith's hammer? Even our children craft knives. No, no, no. Torig is the cause of my sufferings. The betrayer god deliberately cursed me, just to make a laughing stock of me. Harem raises his hand and shakes his fist at someone above. But I won't let myself get I won't let myself to get angry at you, Don Victus. You're an ignorant and blind soul, and my aim is to guide you through the dying world that marches towards its end. Open your eyes or die trying. Grotus will be pleased by either outcome. Okay. I'd like to learn more about dwarves. Uh, most dwarves are self-satisfied, stubborn serving, stubborn fools serving Torig. They don't deserve my at, my good attitude. Harem winces. But you can ask what you want to know. I'll try to answer. Uh, tell me about the Five Kings Mountains. The Dwarven Kingdom, yes. Well, it's to the south from here. It survived many trials, and there will be many. There'll be more yet to come. Harem strokes his beard, contemplating. Uh, there is no unity among the dwarves, Don Victus. Uh, the Five Kings rule over our people. They sit on the thrones of the five greatest cities, and with every passing day it grows harder for them to come to any agreement. The only thing uniting the Five Kings Mountains is the Sky Citadel of Highhelm, the great Dwarven fortress at the mountain's heart. Have the dwarves always lived on the surface? N oh no. Eons ago, all dwarves lived deep beneath the surface, and they did rather well, judging by the historic records. They built fortresses befitting noble dwarves, but our restless god Torag sent us a, sent us a prophecy, the quest for the sky. He ordered all the dwarves to abandon their fortresses and press upwards, to show their beards to the sun, as they say. The journey was long and bloody. Many dwarves perished on the way, others turned back, keeping to their ancient strongholds, eventually to turn into evil Dorogar, grey dwarves. But those who survived reached the surface and founded the Sky Citadels, the most glorious cities in dwarven history. Uh, tell me about the Sky Citadels. Oh, they are the peaks of creation. Glorious cities built by the ancient dwarves who'd finally reached the surface after many hardships, performing the final labor in their quest for the sky on the surface of Glorian. Harem's eyes glitter with admiration. They are steadfast, tall, magnificent. They are beautiful. The ten citadels were built by dwarves, but we've managed to keep only a few. The citadels crumbled, and the orcs, sworn enemies of our people, trampled their blessed streets and ruined the gorgeous palaces of the ancient kings. Harem's eyes grow misty with tears. These were heavy losses, and a disgrace to our people, Don Victus. Highhelm is a jewel of the citadels that, that remain. It is located in the heart of the mountains, and the heart of every dwarf. Yes, yes, my heart too. There's a dwarven saying that, if an enemy reaches Highhelm, every dwarf from all corners of the world will come to defend it. Harem casts a sad glance at you. I'd be there too, but not to help the citadel's defender. Defenders, I'd be there to witness the fall of our people with my own eyes, and mourn it. I would fall upon the cold stone and raise my final prayer to Grotus. Uh, I'd like to talk about your god, Grotus. You wish to learn about Grotus? Harem seems surprised and pleased at the same time. Yes, of course. I will answer anything you ask. Uh, what are Grotus' teachings about in a nutshell? Uh, Grotus is the end of all that exists. Harem smiles. He's obviously been waiting for this question. Look around, Don Victus. What do you see? Look again and realize that everything will be destroyed. Our clothing and our armor will turn to dust. The walls of the palaces will crumble into ruins. The trees will fall. And you and I will die much sooner than that. Uh, one second. Alright. Uh, Grotus is a timeless watcher. 
He's been locked away by Phrasma, the goddess of rebirth. From her boneyard, he watches over the world, knowing the time for the final reaping shall come. He's the bloated mo moon hanging in the sky. He's the harbinger of the last days. He's the one who will stay when all the others are gone. Uh, Phrasma has Grotus locked in her boneyard, so she is stronger than Grotus? Of course she is stronger, for now. Harem nods with dignity, stroking his beard. Grotus is weaker than Phrasma, and many other gods. I'd be a fool if I tried to claim otherwise. If Grotus were stronger, the end times would already have come, wouldn't they? But the powers of other gods fade away. They dissolve slowly, a grain in a century. Grotus collects those grains and waits. He doesn't need to hurry. He knows that his time shall come. Uh, usually clerics can speak with their gods. Uh, what does Grotus say to you? What is his will? Harem shakes his head in resignation. Grotus doesn't speak to his clerics. Clerics. <laughs> Added like two or three syllables to that word. Actually, Grotus doesn't need any clerics. The dwarf raises his sad eyes to you. He only allows his whispers to be heard, and only by those who are dying to hear them. His words are unclear, but they call to you. His voice comes with a soft rustle of fallen leaves, with the woeful wailing wind at the mountain pass, the roar of the raging blizzard, and it calls you to strike out on the road. Onwards, always onwards, over the pass, over the bridge, and further along. Up ahead, where the edge of a grey robe flashed, and a candle sputtered for the last time before dying. Onwards, always onwards, until your feet can no longer carry you. Heron falls silent, submerged in his own thoughts. Well, thanks for telling me about Grotus. I've heard enough for now. Now let me ask, what do you think about Grotus? I like your tales. There's an inner truth to them. A broad smile spreads across Harem's face. I'm glad you think like that. We'll bring this truth to the whole world and tell everyone that the end is inevitable. Have you ever regretted your decision to abandon Toreg and start worshipping Grotus instead? Your question might seem offensive, Don Victus, but I am not offended. I realize you ask it because you wish to learn more about Grotus. Harem squeezes his beard in his fist, but in a moment he lets it free again. Toreg betrayed me, Don Victus. All he's ever done was look down with contempt on all my futile efforts to please him. I crafted armor plates, but they fell apart with a single strike of a fist. I smithed swords, but they broke at the hilt. Torag's priest used to say that such failures were the curse of, the, of their uncompromising deity. Harem's fingers grab his beard with such force that it seems he'll tear a handful of hair out of it. It was Grotus who opened my eyes. He showed me that failure was a manifestation of his will. The end time is near, Don Victus, and every failure is just another step towards it. Torag's curse is only half the reason for my failure. The other half is the blessing of Grotus, which I have borne from early childhood. Harem smiles warmly at his thoughts. So the short answer to your question is no. I've never regretted opening my soul to Grotus. Uh, from what I've heard, Grotus doesn't spare the minds of his clerics. They all go insane eventually. Is that true? Ha! Huh, who told you that? I had to look that slanderer in the eye. Harem bursts into laughter, but you can't understand what's so funny. You see, Don Victus, sanity is quite a relative concept, Harem says as his laughter recedes. Each of us is certain that he's the sanest creature in the world. Meanwhile, we periodically doubt the sanity of others. So what happens if two or three people claim that someone else is insane? Does that make it true? Perhaps the accusers have lost their, have lost their minds themselves. The longer Cleric listens to the whispers of Grotus, the better he comprehends the essence of his designs, and the deeper his understanding becomes. Uh, when enlightenment comes, the mind of a Cleric ascends to a new level of understanding, which is inaccessible to simpler souls. Is it insanity? This is for you to decide, Don Victus. My decision was made long ago. When I reach enlightenment, I'll accept it with joy and delight. Yeah, honestly, that's just too much. You're a funny dwarf and you have your peculiarities, but to go insane voluntarily? You should give it up before it's too late. Harem sighs and shakes his head. Can't you understand? That's precisely what I want, for it to be too late. <laughs> Are you sure you want to see the dwarven ruins? Why open up old wounds? Harem looks down and strokes his beard a few times before answering. I'm not sure, Don Victus. This will likely bring nothing but pain. I suspect I'll regret going to the ruins. But nevertheless, I ask, please take me there. Alright. Let's go in here and see what we can loot. In due time. I'll check with Octavia and Reg, make sure they don't have anything to say... Oh, uh, how do you like it in my party? 
I think it's grand. You have a fine gang of lunatics here. I myself am no noble from high society. Haha. <laughs> but seriously, Octavia and I never even dreamed of a leader like you. We imagined we'd sit in the woods and rob wagons, maybe join a band of mercenaries. But we never expected to become the henchmen of a local ruler. Not to mention, such a pretty one. Haha. <laughs> Reg winks at you playfully. Um, yeah, I thought you and Octavia were together. Wouldn't she be jealous? Octavia and I are connected, and this connection cannot be broken. We grew into each other, you know? Jealousy is for weak cowards who don't trust each other and are scared of being tricked. If a knight on the side threatens your love... Oh, we've already talked about that. Yeah, we've already said all that. Alright, keep your compliments to yourself. We're out of here. Because I already know who I'm going to romance. I guess none of these... I'm not really stuff to loot around the town. I'll do it once around real quick and make sure. I'm there. Oh, we can't go any further that way anyway. All right. And this well. The well looks quite ordinary, and yet when you approach it, you feel a strange tingling in your temples. All right. Let's go into this building here. Don't mind me, everybody. I'm off. Just ensuring you guys don't have any contraband stuff anywhere. Yeah, I can't lockpick that one. Oh yeah, Arsino. A woman in rich gold embroidered clothes greets you with a polite bow. Her eyes, the color of molten gold, shine brightly in your dus in her dusky face. Like greetings, noble ruler of these lands. My name is Arsino. I'm a messenger from the Temple of Abadar in Absalom, and I came here assuming the citizens of your young barony could use the services of a priest. Arsino stares at you for a moment, then adds with noticeable warmth. I'm glad to meet another person marked by celestial blood here. And what services do you offer? I can tell you various divine scr spell scrolls. Uh, they're quite useful, even if you don't have anyone in your party who can read them. While you're in this settlement, or indeed any place with a cleric willing to help, uh, you only need to open your bag and choose the scroll you wish to cast. I'll be happy to read it for you. However, take care out there in the wilderness. A scroll is useless, useless without someone who can read it. To use the journey... Oh my goodness, I can't read. To use a scroll in your journeys, you'll need a spellcaster whose magical training covers such spells, or someone skilled in magical devices. Uh, tell me about Abadar. With pleasure. Abadar is the god of cities, law, merchants, and wealth. The core of his teachings is simple. Law and order allow civilization to develop, which allows people to live in peace and prosperity. Fair still favors old customs, small settlements, and simple trade trades like hunting, then Abadar patronizes development, complex trades, order, and entrepreneurship. Each priest of Abadar finds something personal in serving him. Some believe that law is the main aspect of their faith, and they guard it zealously. Others put the well-being of their society above all. I personally follow Abadar's teaching that say civilization must penetrate the wildest savage lands and help people live in comfort and safety. Uh, you're an, As an Asimar, if I'm not mistaken. I suppose it's easy to tell, isn't it? Yes, I'm an Asimar, though I'm not sure how or when the blood of Celestials appeared in my family. Among all my relatives and known ancestors, I'm the only one who inherited it. I must admit, I'm glad this lot fell to me. It draws more attention to me, a useful trait for a priest who wishes to gather a congregation. And how'd you come to be in my barony? That's a long story and not a terribly exciting one. I was born and raised in Absalom, but I saw little point in staying there. What's the purpose in promoting the faith of Abadar in a city already so large and well-developed? No, I was drawn to backwater places, where civilization was just beginning to emerge. It gives me such joy to see the first stones of a new settlement being laid, or to see wilderness that once harbored monsters and criminals become a safe, cozy home for people. I devoted my life to my travels, choosing to visit places like your barony. Allow me to say, it's a place after my own heart. A city growing over the remains of a bandit lord's lair is exactly the sort of triumph of civilization Abadar prescribes. I hope my skills as a priest will be of service to these lands and their denizens. If you're so eager to help the citizens, uh, why do you charge for your services? It's part of Abadar's philosophy. The rules of trade and exchange developed for a reason. They help us bring order to our world, and they mustn't be broken without need. The opportunity to get what one desires for no effort has a corrupting effect on souls. Alright, she has a bunch of, uh... 
Divine Scrolls. In due time. Very useful indeed. Alright. So this is Kaisi's home. In one second. Gotta sip coffee every now and then to soothe my throat. Doing a lot of reading and talking. Alright. A tense silence hangs over the house. Kaisi, your tiefling friend, emerges from the shadows. Her eyes are staring into the distance. She seems to look right past you. No, not now. The turmoil is suddenly over, but you see fear in Kaisi's eyes. Her blue eyes. It's you. I wanted to say I... I... Yeah, please don't be afraid. You can tell me the truth. What's going on? The girl closes her eyes and clenches her fists, obviously in the grip of a strong emotion, but one you cannot read. I knew it couldn't last forever. Why did he... Why did he even make this rule, if he knew it would be impossible to keep? She takes a deep breath, opens her eyes, and speaks with firm resolve. Come what may, you should know, Don Victus, that the person you know by the name of Kaisi does not exist. My real name is Kalika, and I... We... Well, it's a long story. Such stories are better told beside a welcoming fire. Will you hear me out? Yeah, fine, let's go. The girl rests her head in her arm and stares off into the distance, lost in memory. Also, we're not beside a fire. Stories by the fire. In the desert where I was born, my fondest memory. When the day is done, hosts and guests, parents and children, friends and rivals, all gather by the fire under the stars to tell their tales. All they did, all they witnessed, and all they heard from other travelers, and the whispers carried by the desert wind. My sister and I often snuck in to, snuck in to hear these stories, hiding in the shadows just beyond the circle of light and warmth. We're Hellspawn, you see. Tieflings are unwelcome guests in Kadira, unblessed by the light of merciful Serenre. We grew up sleeping in a common tent, scavenging food here and there like orphans, all but outcasts and disowned. We were 13 when we left, and set off to find happiness in the cities, and everyone we left behind sighed with relief. Uh, my sister and I, we are twins, but as different as the sun and moon. Her name is Canera, which means silent flame. She is fire, a cold fire, but one that turns everything to ash. I am a river. It brings me joy to give water to tired travelers and nurture green shoots. But when I flood, I am bound to bring death. The girl's eyes are full of sorrow. Despite our differences, we are one. Our lives belong to the divine Nethys, and by his mercy we now live, in turns. While one of us is here, the other sleeps in another plane, and when she wakes up, we switch places. Just as you wit- just as you just witnessed. So this is why you didn't remember me when we were talking to Jamandi Aldori. How could I remember you? I never met you at the time. That was Canera. She was the one who talked to you at the reception and helped you fight off the assassins. We usually write each other notes, recounting in detail all that happened, and describing any friends that Kaisi had made. But that time we were switched right in the middle of a mansion engulfed in fire and filled with assassins. Canera didn't have the time to write any notes. And how is it you began to live in turns? Kalika lowers her head. Now this story, it's one I've never told to anyone before. No one in the whole world. And it's not easy to confide in a stranger. There's too much grief and guilt in it. If you don't mind, I'd rather not go into all the details. You see, my sister died, and I couldn't get over it. Canera was killed by a soul eater. A monster summoned by secret followers of Abaddon's arch, arch demons. Or arch demons. Those who summoned him died in the fight, but the beast was too strong for my sister, and I wasn't even there to protect her. Kalika catches her breath. I... we just had a fight, we both did some stupid things just before, but I don't want to talk about that now. When I found out what happened to my sister, I was ready to make a deal with any power, if only I could just get her back. And I found such a power. I was contacted by the Arcanothane, the herald of the god Nethys himself. She promised she would return Canera to life, but on two conditions. First, we must both keep the arrangement a secret. Second, we would never be able to meet again. And so our new life began. Now we flee through the world, guarding our secret, always introducing ourselves as Kaisi to hide that there are two of us. And we switch places with each other at random. While one lives, the other sleeps in a demiplane, one created specifically for us. And you can't control these switches? No, we can't. They happen at random, most often while we're sleeping, but sometimes in broad daylight. That's why we can never stay in one place for long. When someone witnesses us switch, we usually tell them tales of a special magical way of traveling. But people start noticing strange things and begin to figure things out. Truth be told, I'm so tired of having to pretend. We knew this couldn't last forever, and now the truth is finally out. 
Uh, what's the point in all in all this? Well, you revealed your secret to me. It means you broke one of the rules set by the deity's herald. Yes. Will you make me regret this, Don Victus? I just thought... I felt you might be someone who could help my sister and me change our fates. And what can I do to help? That's actually what I wanted to talk to you about. Canera was supposed to tell you of an ancient treasury that we've been looking for. Gold isn't the only thing of value in this place. It may contain an ancient relic taken by the Talden Raiders from a respected Kadiran temple of Nethys. It's an unusual relic called the Disk of the Eclipse. I once heard a beautiful story that it was created from the shadow that hides the sun and the moon. The shadow that... okay. But I don't think that could be the truth. Nethys is the god of magic, who was once a mortal wizard, and relics from his temples are usually very powerful. There are many among his followers who think that solving the mysteries of magic, even rivaling their deity, is the best way to serve him. One such follower created the disc long ago in the distant past. According to legend, it gave its owners control over planar travel. But only pairs of wizards bound by unbreakable ties could use it. While one of them traveled the planes, the other was his anchor in our world, and they could switch between. Do you see now why we so desperately wish to find the disc? It might help us understand how the switch between me and Canera works, and it should make our divine patron happy. Nethus and his assistants value the desire to understand the mysteries of magic above all else. And how did this disc come to be in the Stolen Lands? It was brought here by Taldans from the Fifth Army of Exploration. Taldor and Kadira were enemies for ages. Thousands of years ago, a soldier broke into the Temple of Nethus and stole the relic, to sell it or to secretly hoard it as an heirloom. Hundreds of years later, his own kin, or the kin of its hundredth buyer, brought the disc to these strange lands, where the Taldans had come, uninvited as usual, in which they finally vanished from, vanished from with little trace. Sometimes history is as intricate lace, you never guess where it begins and where it ends. Uh, tell me about the location of the treasury. It was called Sorrow Flow in the chronicle we read. It was once a Talden town founded by the veterans of the Fifth Army of Exploration. It stood on the shores of a turbulent river, and that was what destroyed it. One night, a terrible flood devastated the settlement, killing many and driving the rest to flee. Only the tower on the cliff remained, which is too high for the flood to reach. Water covered the ruins for a long time, but last year it receded. My friends found a chronicle which recounted the destruction of the city, and spoke of the disk of the eclipse which was kept there. They managed to track down the ruins, but were frightened away by the monsters and beasts that roamed the area. Yeah, if this can help, then I agree. Kalika's uh, sad eyes get a little warmer. Thank you. I'll wait for you there at Sorrowflow. And please, let's explore the ruins together. Just the two of us. I don't want to give myself away again in front of your companions. Breaking the Arcano Breaking the Arcano Thane's conditions was once was enough. I have no wish to anger our god. So long. Alright, so we have a quest. We have to go there by ourselves. Last time I did it, I was a pretty high level. Um, I don't know how it's going to go this time. It's locked, of course it is. Doesn't she have a diary out here that I could grab? Maybe not yet. Alright, full plate. It is bladed plate. I think it's plus three. Yeah, plus three and it's bladed. A creature that attacks the wearer of this plus three full plate with a melee weapon, an iron arm strike, or a natural weapon takes one to four plus one slashing damage. Creatures using melee weapons with reach are unaffected by this armor. But it's really good. It's... I used it for most of the game last time. Um... But yeah, there you go. It's a very good, very good piece of equipment. Alright, so now all we have left is a tavern. I uh, will stop by and see if Valerie or Tristan has anything to say. I doubt that they do. Oh, yeah, there's a couple of people here we can talk to. Uh, Highland. You see a stout man suited in well-worn armor. His face is framed with silvery stubble, and his fleshy nose is red and pockmarked. He radiates perfect calm. As you approach, he bows, respectfully and with dignity. Highland, your grace. Captain of the city guard. A young dwarf girl salutes you awkwardly. Delia, assistant to, or Delia? assistant to the captain. Happy to serve your grace. I don't remember hiring a guard captain, or any guards for that matter. I came here from Restov with a dozen of my best guards, by order of Lady Jamandi Outdori, your grace. I hired the rest from among the locals. Don't worry, your grace. We are now the subjects of the barony. We've, swor we've sworn to serve you faithfully and loyally, and you can count on us. Besides, we draw our salary from your chests. 
The captain looks at the female guard raising his brow, then sighs and looks at you. Of course, every one of us is ready to die protecting your grace, but there's still some work to be done when it comes to discipline. You know that dwarven author, Baldrick Zebris? Garlic Tundras? The name escapes me. My boneheads used to read his books about guard's duty right on, right on guard duty. I have to teach them a lesson or two. I'd like to learn something about those who serve me. Of course, you grace. I've been a guard all my life. I started a snot-nosed runt in the night watch. Restov is famous for its fencing schools. Young people from all over the river kingdoms come to study there. It seems every other person has a sword, and every third thinks they know how to use it better than all the rest. A misspoken word or drunken fight can quickly lead to a stabbing rampage. That's why there are so many guards in the city, and they don't accept just anyone. Lady Jamadi took note of my achievements and marked me for advancement. That's why I'm here. As for Delia, I found her on the street, about a decade ago. I remember vividly, a tiny dwarf girl sitting on the temple steps. Dirty face, barefoot, feeding a piece of bread to a stray cat. I saw her and my heart missed a beat. The captain looks away. Where she's from, who left her alone and why, only Aristotle knows. As she grew, I tried to, send, tried to send her to learn a craft, but who can talk sense into a dwarf? She wanted to be a guard, and that's that. So now I'm teaching her myself. Lucky she has a head on her shoulders and a fair bit of strength. Alright, Highland, do the guards have everything they need? There are sufficient munitions and supplies, Your Grace. The salary is fair, we have enough to buy toys for the kids and a jug of beer when the shift is done. Of course, the town is growing. It would be nice to expand the ranks, but we can manage that ourselves. Alright, we'll have a quiet shift. Delia? Okay. Follow if you dare. So either you show me your entry permit, we take this conversation to the interrogation room. Please have mercy, just a moment. Interesting. Oh wait, I can go in here? Don't mind me, citizen. Just uh, grabbing your dwarven stout and your bone necklace. Tristan, anything to say? Nope. Alright, to the tavern. missing some big decor but we'll make up for that scattered ink stain suggests that Lindsay may have spent some time here she's normally in here isn't she someone carved a body poem about the origin of the name stag lord which you don't get to read I wish I could actually read the poem all right I'll do it once around loot everything talk to some people there's only, only one person to talk to in here, unless Amiria or Jathal have something to say. In due time. The Beer Mug Inn. Not a very creative name. That also gets remedied later. I'm off. So Normal Eight Eyes, that's who you talk to. I don't know if I've covered this on the channel yet or not. Or in the series. But Noro Eight Eyes is the one that, uh... I'm there. I wonder what's in that. Eventually I'll play someone who can lockpick and, uh... I'll be able to open up all these chests in the town. But Noro Eight Eyes is the person that you respec with. But if you're playing on challenging or above, you don't get to respec. Right on the wall, Adori crossed out, Sertova crossed out, beer underlined. Also locked. I do what I must. Ooh. A Dorvan war axe. Interesting. So the reason why I picked heavy maces for harem is because of the uh Cause I know that you find some good heavy maces later on, but they've added more weapons, so maybe I should have waited until I picked his uh his weapon focus. Follow if you dare. All right, Alina. Behind the inn's bar stands a young woman with curly red hair, a round face, and rosy cheeks. She gives you a friendly smile, fixing her cap. So nice of you to stop by, Your Grace. I'm Alina, the innkeeper. Um, yeah, show us what treats you have. So she sells milk. She doesn't sell chocolate though. She sell butter? No. Alright, uh, tell me about yourself. I'd be happy to, Your Grace. 
I love to talk, especially about myself. Uh, where are you from? What land? Which family? I hail from the River Kingdoms. Our, our tomb, to be precise. I'm from a farming family. Just, like, just about everybody from around here, there. Uh, there's more fertile land and pasture there than anywhere in the River like Kingdoms, except for maybe seven arches. The folks who grow cops... Cops. Crops and ten cattle are well respected there. But at the same time, they live in constant danger. There's too many bad people, too lazy to work all day, but don't mind taking other people's things. And why did you decide to become an innkeeper? I was bored. Please don't get me wrong. I was fine at Father's Farm, and I've got nothing but respect for farmer's work. But back in our country, or back, but in our back country, you could go half a year without seeing a new, one new face. No news, nothing happening. I've dreamed of working at an inn since I was a child. That's the kind of place where there's always lots of guests and stories. Where's the inn's name come from? I don't ask, it's too funny. I kept thinking about what name to pick, choosing just the right one, but not one to, but not one to waste time. I drew a beer mug on the door. I figured folks would just see it and come on in. So locals got used to calling the place the beer mug inn, so the name stuck. Yeah. I wonder if that's actually a joke towards the icon on the map, because if you like hit the Look at the map and while you're in the main square, the icon for the tavern is just a beer mug. Anyway, uh, let's see, tell me about the River Kingdoms. A month wouldn't be long enough to tell it all, your grace. Each kingdom is a special place all its own. Elves live in one of them, another one half the country belongs to the Murderer's Guild, and the other half gives them, gives them their orders. They say that even they even get locals' discounts. There's just one thing that unites us all, like a strong thread keeps a quilt together. It's the Six River Freedoms. The Six River Freedoms. Yes, the first freedom. Say what you will, I live free. It doesn't mean you won't get beaten up for what you say, though. The second freedom. Well, if you can call it a freedom. Oath breakers die. Those who break oaths get killed just like that. So people prefer not making any oaths at all. The third freedom. Walk any road, float any river. Once the ruler of High Bar decided to build a gate across the river and collect a fee from each passing boat. Well, there's no more High Bar. The fourth freedom is even worse than the second. Second one. Courts are for kings. Whatever a king says goes. Well, as long as he doesn't get... Well, as long as he doesn't say to build a gate across a river. <laughs> now for the fifth. Slavery is an abomination. Nothing to explain there. Runaway slaves from all over come to us for a reason. And the sixth, you have what you hold. It means that theft is much worse crime than robbery, if you catch my drift. You can honestly beat a robber and keep what's yours, but a thief acts on the quiet. Shame on him. That's just disrespectful. Thank you, Lena. We'll discuss it another time. Alright, and that's uh, everybody in the barony. So in the next episode, we'll finally start uh, exploring. Let's go to the exit. I'm actually going to kick everybody out. Because uh, first thing we're going to do, because I... Forgot about that. Shoot. All right, let's get to the main square. I have to manage my inventory off camera so that I can travel by myself because I have too much crap in my inventory currently. Because I'm really close to leveling up here. So I want to do uh, Kaisi's quest. Kaisi's going to be one of our main companions. So right now it's going to be my main character, obviously. A Kaisi, Lindsay, a cleric. I haven't actually decided. I'm probably going to take care I'm of him, there. honestly. And then um, a DPS of some kind. There's two companions. I'm going to use one for one chapter, and then once we get the next one, I'll probably keep him around. I don't want to spoil anything. And then... uh. Oh wait, no, hold on. That's not going to work. Because I'm going to bring Amiri, Jathal. They're going to be two of my companions. Lindsay, Kaisi. Yeah, then a DPS class. Yeah, that works. Well, no, because then I don't have a cleric. Uh-oh. I didn't plan this out. Anyway, I'm going to call it here. Next episode, we'll begin exploring. Uh, either meet Kaisi at Sorrowflow, or we'll do something else first. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next episode.